Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining the session today. Um, my name is JJ and I'm with Gobi Partners. And I'm really excited to bring to you our programming for today on agri-food tech in Thailand. This session is a collaboration between Gobi Partners and ID Capital in which both organizations look to advance tech startups that help to increase sustainability in the food value chain in Asia. For today, we're gonna to kick it off with a discussion on how technology and startups can solve the global hunger problem. This will be a fireside chat with Ren Hua, CEO of Taiwa. After that, we'll be zeroing in on Thailand, bringing you a panel with three Thai startups, Fresh Cut, Recalled, and Let's Plant Meat, to showcase how they're creating innovative solutions from three very different angles in the ag and food tech scene. And without further ado, please allow me to introduce our moderator, Paul Ark, advisor at Gobi Partners, onto the stage. Well, welcome everyone to uh, our topic for today, which is can technology and startups solve the global hunger problem? It's quite a meaty topic for 30 minutes. So I want to jump right in and introduce our highlight speaker, Mr. Ho Ren Hua of Taiwa. Ren Hua, welcome uh, to this fireside chat. Can you share with us a, a brief introduction of who you are and what Taiwa does? Hi, Paul. Good to see you again. And uh, hi, everybody. And greetings from uh, Bangkok. Uh, Taiwa, we are based here in Bangkok as one of the regional leaders in the starch and food products. So we have a range of operations across tapioca, mung bean, rice, and basically taking Southeast Asia's uh, food plants uh, from farm to shelf. The company has 14 operations across the region, uh, primarily based in Bangkok, uh, but also operations with in China, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Indonesia. Uh, we're also proud to be you know, partners and sponsors with FFA for the second year running. So last year we helped to, you know, amidst the, uh, the COVID pandemic, we helped to be the satellite partner to host FFA in Bangkok and look forward to building the partnership going forward. Um, I think the topic, as you talked about, alluded to, you know, Paul, in terms of thinking about innovation, thinking about technology, thinking about solving problems, is definitely a big one. And you know, looking forward to how we can kind of like bite size or deconstruct the problem today in various dimensions. Yes, thank you very much for for that, Renhua. Um, yeah, I, you know, as as you mentioned, you know, global hunger is is quite a large problem to solve. What I'd like to do is sort of set the stage, set some context with a couple of facts and statistics that will allow us to break down the problem into you know more bite-sized dimensions, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, so one interesting uh, thing about global hunger is that 815 million people around the world, about 10% of the world's population is hungry, malnourished, or starving. So one in every 10 is living in a state of food poverty or caloric poverty. Uh, but at the same time, 2.3 billion people, about 30% of the world's population uh, is overweight or obese. So we're, we're, we're looking at a, a, an incredible caloric gap between those that aren't getting enough food and calories and those that actually have way too many. So that sort of lends itself to the fact that it's not an issue of the world not being able to produce enough food. In fact, one third of the world's edible food is wasted every year. So 1.3 billion tons uh, of food is wasted. That amounts to about $2.6 trillion of uh, wasted food annually. And that's about enough to feed that hungry population about four times over. So it isn't a question of whether we're producing enough food, but it's a question of, you know, are we producing food and getting food to the right places? And as a result, what is that, you know, all that food that gets wasted that goes into landfills actually accounts for 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So this is no longer a, a social problem. This is no longer a public health problem. This is actually a big environmental problem. So what I'd like to do is delve into kind of each of those three areas. One, you know, sort of being that caloric deficiency among the hungry. Uh, the second being, you know, an overabundance of not just calories, but largely poor quality calories that is creating an obesity epidemic, uh, and then the implications of all that food waste. So let's start with sort of that deficiency in calories, you know, the most direct issue about food hunger. 
And I'd like to get your view, uh, Renoir, on what sort of technologies are we looking at today that could potentially solve that caloric deficiency? Are there any areas or projects that Taiwan is working on to contribute to those solutions? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, you know, the way I think about it, when we think about food waste, I think it is, you know, the entire food ecosystem is really a linked chain, it's really a value chain, right? So if you think about, you know, starting from the farm, uh, in terms of farmers, all the way to processes like ourselves, and the supply chain all the way to the retail level, it's really a linked value chain uh, from farm to shelf. So it's not, you know, the way I would think about, you know, waste in general, not just food waste, in terms of, you know, do you need 10 different types of packaged foods or 20 different types of packaged foods, but it's really to broaden, you know, the entire ecosystem and to look at different parts of agricultural waste, where can we potentially, you know, reduce, reuse, or even recycle. For Taiwan in particular, because we you know, play along the entire value chain from farm to shelf. So we work with farmers to actually grow the crops, primarily being tapioca, mung bean and rice. We do a lot of the processing and then we work with you know, FMCG partners. We very much focus on the midstream part so that we can actually improve the circularity to really get back, you know, whether it's additional calories, additional carbohydrates or additional protein. I give you a very simple example. Uh, currently, we are one of the largest exporters for tapioca uh, from this part of the world uh, you know, to a global market. You know, we do almost a bit less than half a million tons of tapioca starch exported from Indochina to the rest of the world. For every one ton of tapioca root, you actually have about 35 to 40% of pulp as a byproduct. That byproduct today in the whole industry is actually not being actively used as a fiber product you know, fortified with other different meals or other different ingredients. So that's a very clear example where we actually can think about, you know, turning agricultural waste back into, you know, high value food ingredients, serving back to our customers. So the concept, I think, of, you know, along different parts of the value chain, how do we think about agricultural waste? How do we think about recycling, reusing? I think it's a very important part that companies themselves have to really think about for every ton of output you know, what else and what other products can you actually convert to give back you know, to the consumer? So that's the first dimension I'll think about it really, you know, to your question of the entire ecosystem and thinking about waste and either recycling, reducing, reusing across the entire value chain. The second part will be really an upstream. Um, I think a lot of the um, deficiencies, whether it's in the food ecosystem, it's in you know, calorie uptake, really starts at the source. Again, putting the end value chain aside, so whether you've got, you know, if there's overeating, so to speak, in, in, in McDonald's or, you know, packaged products or beverages, that's really in the retail ecosystem, right? That's a separate value chain because that's really permeates in developed countries. In developing countries, emerging markets, so Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, places that we operate in, a lot of the key focus for sustainability happens upstream, you know, in particular, working with uh, farmers, you know, farm communities, uh, farm livelihoods. To that extent, we work with over, you know, 10,000 farmers across the entire region. So Thailand being the core, uh, but also Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar. And developing, you know, a range of different technologies and agriculture tools to help them increase their livelihood will really benefit the rural communities. Because what we're actually saying is that for developing countries, you know, their access to, you know, whether it's McDonald's or it's a Kit Kat or it's a healthy meal, it's a lot less, right? So for them, fundamentally, it's a lot about increasing their own agricultural income. So the range of technology that we use, whether it's, um, you know, we use agricultural workshops, we've innovated a new type of compost fertilizer, we're using a new different types of satellite imagery, really focusing at the farm level to increase farm incomes and farm livelihoods. I think it's an important dimension of actually trying to address the overall issue of calorie deficiency or even hunger. So those are, I think, the two key dimensions that for Taiwan in particular, because we focus on the midstream, that we're trying to bring across the value chain. Thank you for that. I, I, think, um, I think a lot of what you said really does solve issues and improve conditions on the supply side of food and those who are producing food. I think as you know, a global uh, economy and a food industry, I think we're still struggling to get that food to those that need it. And you know, we've got 
you know, these big supply and demand imbalances. What do you think the food industry, the global food industry needs to do, whether it's uh, from a production point of view, whether it's from a logistics point of view, to make sure that all that food that we're producing gets to the places where it needs to be rather than inside of a landfill? Yeah, I think partly, you're right, Paul, I think part of the, part of the problem, which is, you know, once we think through the root cause problem, we can think through different solutions. Part of the problem is that um, the developed countries are really driving up retail prices. So if you think about the world's food commodities, right, whether it's rice, it's grain, it's in some ways tapioca is a very niche crop that we focus in in Southeast Asia. But across the main, you know, agricultural commodities, whether it's rice, wheat, grain, corn, potato, you know, generally in, 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 in a capitalist market, it goes, it's being driven by the highest prices, right? I totally agree. The world needs probably a lot less, you know, you don't need a thousand SKUs in New York or another thousand SKUs or different types of food in San Francisco, right? But the reality is that because food processing is ultimately pulled along by the highest bidders and highest price, a lot of those things are driven to uh, the developed markets. One thing I think that, you know, agri-processors or agri-food companies such as ourselves would be you know, be a lot more uh, intentional in developing strategies across broader markets. So for Taiwan in particular, I mean, it's very easy for us to just say, okay, we're going to, sh you know, ship all our products to the US or to the Europe and then get the maximum profit margin. So I think by being much more intentional, still being very profitable, of course, and still being very commercial about it, but being very much more intentional about where your food and supply chain partnerships are being developed. For example, I think for us uh, this year, you know, despite the COVID pandemic, we're making a very big push in Indonesia. So last year we shipped about, you know, I think close to about nine, 10,000 tons of our tapioca product to Indonesia. This year we look to increasing that to 12,000 tons. We built a presence in Indonesia where people use tapioca products for a range of different food categories, sauces, ready meals, savory snacks. The same 12,000 tons that we worked with a partner in Indonesia could have easily gone to the US or Europe, right? Because that's where you go to the highest bidder. But I think what we can do in our space is just to develop a much more balanced commercial strategy where obviously it's still very profitable, very commercial, but really look at, you know, redirecting or balancing some of apply to different commercial markets. Similar case would be for Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam, we launched um, a new fresh ready to eat noodle. We've done in country production in Vietnam and we've now scaled to over 5,000 outlets across the whole of Vietnam. So in that sense, I think private sector players such as ourselves, you know, companies really taking a leadership role to drive the commercial success in developing markets, I think will be a very key feature over the next decade. If not, we'll just be, you know, we'll just be tied to the, you know, the, the capitalist model of the highest bidder, right? Where high prices of food and high prices of package SKUs in New York and San Francisco and London will drive up food prices. So there is a role to play, I think, for different players along the value chain. Yeah, and I, I think you, you bring up a really interesting point, which, frankly, if we had way more time, I'd love to drill down even deeper. Uh, the, the idea that you know, you're, you're moving a lot of your uh, sort of value-added processing and production closer to uh, the markets you're serving. Um, you know, I think in the food space, you know, we're, we're talking about the concept known as food miles, you know, the amount of miles that food ultimately has to travel, you know, before it reaches consumers' tables. And, you know, the, the ability to reduce the food miles certainly has an impact on the ultimate retail cost to consumers uh, and ultimately on the environmental impact. You know, we're, we're talking about food waste and landfills, you know, we're not even touching on things like, you know, energy and transportation costs and whatnot. But, you know, I think it does touch on a very critical point and problem with regards to getting calories from one location to another in solving this deficiency. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about that, that second pillar about, you know, the overabundance of calories in certain markets and, and the problems that come with that, particularly healthcare, nutrition, obesity. You know, I, I think when people think about obesity, they think about you know, highly developed Western countries like the US and Europe. But I think what many people may not realize is that developing markets, like particularly the ones in Southeast Asia, or, or even the large growing economies like China and India, where you're seeing an explosion 
of obesity and, and all the chronic conditions that come with that, you know, and, and that could arguably be traced back to the poor quality of calories that were ingested. What many view as empty calories, you know, junk food, highly processed foods. You know, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on what's happening globally in terms of technology and maybe even startups that are trying to tackle this problem with poor quality calories and poor nutrition as a result. I think it's a great point. It's a very important point that ultimately we want to have the right, so to speak, the optimal amount of calories, right? So if you think across, you know, nutritional perspective, um, you know, we've got carbohydrates, you've got fibers, you've got proteins, you've got others. I think one of the most important trends um, in this decade uh, would clearly be the cost curve coming down for plant-based diets. Mm. So I think that's a very key trend that every player has to you know, put an effort in. So Taiwan, we focus specifically on the crops in Southeast Asia. Uh, so we're doing stuff in mung bean protein, we're doing stuff in rice protein, we're doing stuff in tapioca fiber. So over, over a period of time, you know, besides some of the most innovative companies in plant-based protein, if in general the cost curve for plant-based diet comes down from a processing point of view, it will lend itself to coming down from a consumer point of view because you just make it a lot more affordable. So that's, I think, a very positive trend. And that happens through you know, partnerships and ecosystems, whether it's you know, plant-based startups, it's processes like Taiwan, it's you know, consumer awareness. The second part of it, I still go back to the point about uh, productivity. Um, I give a very simple example. We are looking at you know, developing a big project in mung bean protein. And mung bean can be used for a variety of different protein isolates, which has unique you know, functional profiles and functional advantages that can be complementary to two of the two main protein sources, which is namely uh, soy protein uh, as well as pea protein. But then one of the issues with mung bean protein is back to the farm level, right? When we started ring fencing, uh, small um, kind of like sandbox in Lotbury, where we started piloting on agricultural productivity, you know, cost per rye, yield per rye fertilizer, we still need another, a few more months to actually develop a sandbox model that can be replicated across the entire country. Again, that is still an intention and the focus is there. But once you can crack it on the agricultural productivity and make crops a lot more affordable and a lot more productive, for every plant that you extract out, a plant has water, carbohydrates, fiber, protein, to put it in a very simple form. So I think it comes back to the idea of you know, improving innovation at source or driving transformation at source to increase the productivity per land per acre, I think it's another huge part that will take time. But the more we can do that, the more you can extract value where instead of going to the cheapest offtake, which is typically the carbohydrates and the calories, you really try to monetize and valorize different parts of the plant. So it could be, again, typically it'd be carbohydrates, but it also be fibers, protein, and different aspects. So that's, I think, another... Um, key thing we can do around, you know, really improving the overall value chain where it's a, a mix um, offering of not just, you know, offering the cheapest calories and cheapest carbohydrates, but then, you know, driving more value across the, the entire value chain. Over time, I do think that consumer awareness is, uh, you know, ultimately leads the changes in, you know, perceptions and behavior. Um, clearly in Asia and our part of the world, as you know, in, in Thailand and Singapore and Hong Kong and China, I think there is greater awareness uh, towards plant-based eating. Uh, there's much greater awareness to different forms of uh, nutritional diets. So for example, for Taiwan, we're making a big push in organic products. Uh, tapioca by itself is non-GMO, it's gluten-free. Some of our rice products, many of our rice products are rice noodle products with, you know, focus on a low glycemic index. So the consumer trend is ultimately what leads the way for you know, private com for private sectors and commercial companies ourselves to really adapt our business models to focus on developing, you know, solutions and products for them. This year, for example, I mean, it's only the beginning of 2021, but we had a huge uptake, you know, way more uptake than we expected in organic glucose. So besides, you know, glucose, which is used from tapioca base as, you know, a filler and ingredient for, for cereal bars and snacks, we had much more demand than expected for organic glucose. We couldn't fulfill that demand because we had to go back to the supply chain in Cambodia and Vietnam to see, okay, along the various ways, how do we plant, harvest, and ship. So things like that, that I think, you know, consumer-led awareness and consumer-led innovation is positively driving the value chain for midstream players and processors like ourselves to adapt and move quickly. Thank you. That was a very comprehensive answer. And, and I guess 
from what I take from that, you know, you, you, it sounds like you're seeing innovations that sort of uh, have an impact in three dimensions. One, you know, sort of driving down the cost uh, and, and improving the economics to eat healthier types of food products. Uh, you know, two, um, you know, you know, technologies that sort of have the flexibility so that you're able to take, you know, these kind of innovative uh, food products, the healthier food products and create a variety of different food forms. So you're not sort of limited to um, just a few items, but, you know, making uh, different types of foods, different types of snacks. Uh, and then it also sounds like a lot of the work that uh, you're seeing in the industry and particularly what Taiwa is doing is also um, creating healthier food items that have the types of flavor profiles uh, that folks want. You know, obviously, you know, you know, having uh, cheaper food, healthier food is, is a main driver, but also creating something that people want to eat, something that's delicious. And so it definitely sounds like by attacking kind of those three different factors that, you know, it's sort of the, the economics, uh, the, you know, sort of variety and choice and the flavor, um, you know, we're definitely gonna hopefully see a, a bigger push in the next, couple of years towards healthy calories, uh, you know, and, and perhaps re reducing a lot of the, the health externalities that come with it. So just to, yeah. add, just to add Paul to that, I think, um, no, you're right. You're, you're right. I think the negative externalities are a big part of that. But just to build on that point, I think one important consideration in this conversation about food waste is packaging waste. Hmm. So if you think particularly about food package products, whether it's, you know, bars and cereals and boxes and ready to eat meals. There's an immense amount of packaging waste, even in QSR as well, that is primarily, you know, really happening in developed countries. So the conversation about food waste, not just, you know, giving more, we trying to redirect more calories to developing markets, but developing, you know, different solutions around packaging, particularly, you know, biodegradable packaging, bioplastic packaging, less packaging, recycled packaging, mm. is also a very important part of the entire ecosystem discussion because, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, when you take a cereal bar or a Kit Kat, you know, it goes in your it goes into your stomach. But then the waste from that wrapper, from that box, from that film, is something that we need to be a lot more thoughtful about. And that's starting to unfold. I think you know we've seen a lot of positive momentum in different countries, particularly led by you know Western or developed markets, towards an awareness on packaging solutions. Uh, but I do think it's an important consideration going forward because this is linked in the overall ecosystem of circularity and thinking about. How do we really increase total return uh, after a long period of time? So let, let me ask, you know, because that, that is a fantastic point. And, you know, I've, I've, I've sort of been hearing about different companies either trying to do, you know, as, you know, either biodegradable packaging, in some cases, even edible packaging, or, you know, I, in probably more extreme cases, when you have things like fruit, I mean, a lot of fruit actually has its own natural packaging you know, like an orange, that's the whole point of the peel, but you still see supermarkets, you know, wrapping uh, that in, you know, uh, you know, some sort of plastic cellophane or, or wrap, you know, what, what sort of fires up your imagination in, in, in that space? So we are launching at the end of this year, um, tapioca based uh, bioplastics. So we are actually developing from tapioca plant based solutions, we're actually developing a range of biodegradable plastics and bioplastic solutions. Again, plastics, you mean there are different types of plastic based on flexibility, mechanical properties, and rigidity. What we are looking at is actually essentially to use plants, plant based, using our tapioca starch to develop you know, bioplastics or biopackaging solutions. A tapioca itself would be biodegradable. Uh, it might be compostable you know, when working with other biopolymers. And because of its flexibility, it would be able to adhere or to develop certain new applications. I think the entire um, the, the industry lens around you know, biodegradability and bioplastics is very similar around uh, the cost curve. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a much bigger push now than three years ago around some of the key biopolymers. So you think about PLA, you think about PBAT, you think about PHA. The cost curve over the last you know, three years has dramatically come down. So it is back to a very simple philosophy that if producers and processors like ourselves can produce you know, much more environmentally friendly, much more biodegradable, biocompostable solutions for the retailers or for the customers, they will buy it. Right now, there is a big gap, I think, you know, between the kind of like the classic PE, PP, you know, fossil fuel based compared to the bio based. But over time, I think one has to believe that that cost curve will come down 
And in fact, I'll even go further to say it's the responsibility of companies ourselves to make sure that the cost curve comes down, right? Mm -hmm. If not, you're going to have a similar thing where consumers are going to spend the next 10 years complaining that this is too expensive. And then you've got producers that are ourselves saying, well, you know, we can't produce because they won't buy. So the entire ecosystem of approach of, you know, being led towards, I think, more sustainable, better ecosystem solutions is very positive. Uh, we see it happening. We are putting a lot of effort into it. And I think it really goes hand in hand, right? Because at the end of the day, I think the interests are very simple. Consumers want something which is cheap, good, affordable, environmentally friendly. We need to produce something that works. So that cost curve and that value chain, I do think positively will unfold over the next decade. And it will be very, very transformational if we can do it well. So the circularity of packaging waste, that if we can actually you know, define and redefine, you know, reduce, reuse, recycling, packaging, I do think that has a very big impact, even linked to how we think about food. Because so much of food today in a retail world where we live online in a digital world is, is you know, through food delivery, is through online food, is through online groceries. So the conversation on packaging waste and food waste I think should go hand in hand as well. I, I want to focus on one particular word that you just mentioned, um, the word led. Uh, and I wanted to get your view. Uh, you know, from your perspective, are you seeing these movements towards, you know, sustainability in food and waste and packaging? Is that the consumers, you know, sort of stepping up and demanding better solutions and leading companies and enterprises, to, you know, towards solving these problems or is it you have companies like yourself that are very values driven and you know you're sort of taking it upon yourselves and you're trying to figure out how do we lead customers to this type of awareness or solution or you know is it government sort of coming down on both and saying we just need to do a lot better and we want to see customers adopt these things and companies get in line i mean who's who's kind of leading who no great question paul um personally the personal view if we take a 30 year view, I think we're all in this together. I think it's very, very fundamental that if we look at the general ecological balance, whether it's climate change, it's marine waste, it's packaging waste, it's food waste, plant-based, I think you know, over a 30 year view, we're all in this together. And that's why you know, we feel passionately about being you know, at least one of the small agents of change in our own space. So that, that's kind of the first caveat that I think, you know, regardless of where we are, who we are, where we come from, we are this together for our kids and for the next generation. Specifically in terms of demographic segments, I think the millennials across countries are starting to drive generational change. It may take five years, it may take 10 years, it may take 15 years. And again, it's never gonna be 80% of the population because most people, they just want you know, cheap, good food, which is fine, which is perfectly fine. But I do think you know, the millennial awareness around you know, what is good for you, what is good for me, healthy eating, sustainable eating, ecological balance, I think over the next five or 10 years will have you know, strong uh, impacts across the entire ecosystem. Whether it's 50% of the population, 60% of the population, I don't know, but I think it's a very important part of the conversation. Where that ties back to us and the roles that companies have to play is really around affordability. And it comes back to the starting point that affordability is a mutual responsibility and it's a healthy tension. The consumer wants to pay, you know, let's say $2, because they obviously want the best thing, which is cheap. The producer says, well, you know, I can't produce it for $2. I have to produce it for $3 so I can make a small margin. But that's a very natural tension. And unless there's an open conversation and saying that is a natural tension, you're not going to move the needle. I think that's already happening very positively in plant-based diets and plant-based eating because of all the innovation that's going on, primarily from developing markets, the cost curves are coming down, right? The best plant protein and plant-based innovation companies understand that they have the lower cost dramatically in the next 10 years. And you see that coming down. So that healthy tension around affordability, I do think is a mutual responsibility between producer and consumer. And I'm positive in the next 10 years will unfold in various ways. Mm. Fantastic. Um, what I'd like to do is just sort of take a little bit of a step back. I mean, we've been talking about hunger and all the, the these problems that come with it at a very kind of global scale. A very broad scale, but I would like to kind of narrow down a little bit to Thailand, you know, where we're both sitting now. And, and I wanted to ask, you know, of, of these different problems, whether it's, you know, hunger or uh, obesity or waste, you know, and these are all problems that Thailand are, are struggling with. But do you see one of these problems sort of being 
particularly pronounced in Thailand? Are we struggling with any one of these more than the other? But also, is Thailand in any way uniquely positioned uh, to solve uh, any or all of these problems? The on the ups, okay, so I mean, today's conversation we had we had we had very good threads around you know retail landscape, you know, developed markets, ecosystem, consumer prices. Um, I think at the end of the day, Thailand is net an exporter of food, which is one of Thailand's greatest strengths. Right, so Thailand, we export a lot. You know, Taiwan, we export a lot to China, Taiwan, US, and so forth. So that's the first point that Thailand is and will be, you know, naturally a net exporter of food and a net exporter of agricultural products. I think the challenge and opportunity for Thailand would really be going back to an earlier comment around the upstream and the midstream. So on the upstream side, if you're on a per rye basis, and there are, you know tapioca, I think is over like you know uh, almost 20, 25 million rye. If on a per rye basis through industry ecosystems, you know, private sector, government sector, we can over the next decade increase productivity per rye significantly, then clearly there's win-win, right? Because you, it, it trickles back to livelihood with income. And then also on the consumers, they get you know, cheaper products. So that's the first thing that in terms of agriculture innovation, productivity is very key. The second thing that Thailand is very well-placed is around you know, an earlier comment about ingredient innovation. Um, you know, consumers, whether it's plant-based, and even within plant-based, there are different types of proteins, right? You've got different types of protein isolates, you've got different types of protein concentrates, you've got different types of, uh, you know, uh, techniques for uh, enzyme modification, for emulsification, you know, so on and so forth. I think Thailand is very well-placed to be really a strategic partner for a lot of the plant-based innovation going on around the world. So it could be Singapore, it could be Hong Kong, it could be China, really because there's an abundance of raw material. So not just the crops that we are we know, right? Even if you look into more exotic crops, you know, we're looking at this thing called kutsu, we're looking at sweet potato, we're looking at mung bean, which is relatively niche. Cannabis, as you know, is much talked about, but still in its very early days of what it could be, you know, in the long term. So from an agricultural and ecological perspective, Thailand or even Indochina is very well placed because the abundance of raw material is there. What we have to do is to make sure that this abundance of raw material does not get corrupted. And that's another serious problem. We need to make sure that the, that the soil is left relatively fertile. We need to make sure that the water and water management around the surrounding areas are relatively well managed. We need to make sure we don't over-industrialize. So I think, you know, overall, I think uh, probably a closing comment was that, you know, Thailand has such promise and such opportunity for being, you know, really an innovative export of food to the world we need to do that in a sustainable way, but also maintaining the ecological balance of the environment so that we can really do it not just for the next 10 years, but for the next century. So, so what I'm hearing is that, you know, Thailand not only has the ability to sort of impact sort of downstream processes and, and logistics, but we have, you know, both the, the natural resources as well as the technical capability in food sciences, agri-sciences, chemistry, uh, uh, you know, biosciences to really impact the food ecosystem, even from a very early upstream uh, position and, and sort of have that permeate across, uh, you know, the, the, the global food ecosystem, you know, that, that, that's quite promising. But at the same time, uh, it's incumbent on Thailand to make sure that we sustainably maintain those competitive advantages and we don't overuse, deplete, corrupt the resources we have at hand. That's a very interesting and enlightening point. Yeah, so great. Thank you very much, Ranhua. That was a comprehensive and very enlightening discussion. And I, I certainly hope those that are tuning in are learning a lot about the issues and innovations and, and some of the things that you and Taiwan are doing to tackle the, the global hunger problem. So thank you very much for spending a half hour of your time with us today and a few additional minutes for our upcoming Q&A. Renhua, thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Always a pleasure to see you, and I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you, everyone. Ready, Kap? Hi, Paul. Hey, Renhua. And, uh, Hi. You know, so I, I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed that. I, you know, even though this is the second time I got to see it because it was pre-recorded, I feel like, um, you know, the second time is just as enlightening, and I, I pick up new things as I go. Um, so I want to I want to welcome you back, Quinhua, for our, our live Q and A. Um, 
I'm told that we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, and we, we actually had a number of questions come in both during the registration and since uh, the broadcast over the last half hour. In fact, um, you know, frankly, if we had an hour, we can go through so many fascinating ones, but uh, I have the uh, challenging task of just narrowing it down to one or two. So, um, you know, what I'd like to start with is uh, one that was submitted during the registration process, which I think will be quite relevant to, um, you know, the state of food tech and ag tech in Thailand. And, and, and that is, um, you know, the question to you is, are the current public policies sufficient to support development of ag and food tech innovations? You know, what support do you think the government should provide or consider improving to ease uh, business and drive better progress for Thailand in the food space? Well, thank you, Paul. It's good to, good to connect again. And um, probably we can do that for one hour doing a FFA 21 in June, uh, which are partners with Bangkok. Um, I presume you're talking anything not related to hemp. Because that's probably the flavor of the month, right? Everyone's talking oh, well, we, about. We hemp. actually. Oh, well, okay, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, there was another question asking, "How do you see the cannabis industry developing in Thailand?" So, if you want to take either from a hemp or a non-hemp perspective, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, make the the question your own. Well, you know, frankly, I think I think the hemp discussion is a very it's a very big discussion in and of itself, right? Because I think there are regulatory issues, there are the medical issues, but essentially it's promising, right? I think, you know, to the extent that you can take something and you grow it and you multiply it um, to create a lot of value, I think it's definitely very promising. Um, second, back to your point around uh, entrepreneurship or specifically uh, food and agri tech entrepreneurship. You know, I think, um, and, and just kind of segue into the next session with, you know, I think th three of some of the best entrepreneurs that I know in the region. I don't think there's a problem with entrepreneurial talent per se. Um, I think there's definitely good uh, entrepreneurs who are building uh, solutions, right? So if you think about what you know, Fresh Cat is doing and what you know, Earn is doing and what Quinn Smith is doing, I do think there can be a lot more done, you know, in helping to scale. So there's one thing about you know having smart entrepreneurs and you know, having a, a you know a strong solutions and taking that to a hundred million baht business. But scaling that to you know uh, 500 million baht business, or 1 billion baht business, is different. And I think where the government can come in probably on you know to to chip in would be on a different a few different things, right? First would definitely be around the ecosystem for talent. Um, very close to us is around uh, you know technological talent. And again, you know working with different entrepreneurs, I think once you get past um, you know the first technical team to a second technical team whether it's in agriculture, it's in food science, it's in data, there just isn't an enough you know, talent to build a $100 million business. So a lot of the entrepreneurs are having to insource talent from different parts of the region. So that again, comes back to the issue around education, you know, grooming skills. So I think that whole theme around entrepreneurial talent is definitely one thing that from a public sector point of view, uh, we can see how we can build stronger ecosystems. The second thing, of course, around funding. Um, again, there are certain funding uh, programs out there, whether it's at the university level, it's at the NASDAQ level. Um, it's quite uh, decentralized. It's, and I know government right now is trying to centralize different things, different pools of funding. But if over time, you know, entrepreneurs, whether they are at a very, very early stage or even at a growth stage, there could be more centralized forms of funding just to really get things going. Uh, that would you know, probably help in some form. Fantastic. Uh, and ju just one last question before uh, we transition over to our panel. Uh, you know, what, what is what is Taiwan's uh, strategy when it comes to, to innovation? Is it, you know, how do you balance between, uh, you know, maybe in-house innovation versus collaboration with uh, external startups and companies? You know, is it one or the other or a fair balance between the two? Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a plunk, obviously, because um, you know I know I know Bell and I know Earn and I know Gwen Smith and they are fantastic and I'm very excited. You know they are you know continuing this conversation. For us as a food company, as a processor, essentially we think of there's two levels: uh, R and D and innovation. R and D by definition is you know relatively long term. Um, so what I mentioned in terms of plant protein and bioplastics and working biopolymers, typically we are thinking you know three to five years or even more. So we're a very strong uh, R&D team. Uh, we do it in-house. Uh, we're based in Chulalongkorn University. Uh, across the region, we work with uh, CU, Chula, uh, KU, Kasetsat, 
and an A star in Singapore. So there's a very strong R and D ecosystem with a longer term view, and that typically you know three to five years. Um, in regards to innovation per se, it could be process, it could be platform, it could be product. You know, we collaborate. So we again, you know, the, the plug is you know we worked with with Fresh Cat, we worked with uh, Recal, you know, we're working with uh, you know Let's Plant Meat. Yeah. So I think the first part I was just talking about R and D, and then the second part would be really around you know innovation systems. So working with startups, you know, insourcing different technologies, scaling different solutions. I think that has to be part of the equation. Um, so essentially, you know, two main parts on the R and D part and on the innovation partnerships. And finally, the final plug would be, um, you know, we're very happy to be working at FFA. Um, I really do think that, you know, innovation in terms of knowledge, in terms of insights is one of the most important things going forward. And to even build this ecosystem of sharing insights is critical for all of us. So thank you, Paul, uh, and look forward to seeing you soon, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks for a drink. Likewise, thank you, Renoir. Uh, and any questions that you had of Renoir that you didn't get to answer today, I would highly encourage you to seek him out. Um, he is just a, a fountain of, of knowledge and, and quite generous uh, with his wisdom. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to hand things back to JJ as we head into our panel. All right. Thank you, Paul and Renhua. And now that we've delved into the global hunger problem, touched on a few other topics like food and packaging waste and ways that large companies like Taiwan are tackling these issues at a regional level. Um, we'd like to delve a little deeper into how startups locally in Thailand are tackling this problem and hopefully uncover some learnings that can be scaled across the region. Um, so next up, we'll have three Thai startups. I'm happy to welcome onto the stage our moderator, Isabel Deceit, um, CEO of ID Capital. Hello, everybody. A pleasure to be with you today. I came to Thailand in early 2017 to visit Foodinopolis at Thailand Science Park. It was all new, splendid, and since the construction work had just been delivered, it was empty, you still had the plastic wraps on the, on the windows. And the people who welcomed me explained the vision that they had. Space F was not even a concept. Our discussion today is a testament to the fact that things have changed very fast and for the best in Thailand. The momentum around food and agri-innovation is not specific to Thailand. Accelerators, incubators have bloomed everywhere, but Thailand has a few assets. Thai products are in very high demand on international markets, in particular with ready-to-eat food that is really providing a handy solution to people working from home. And also to be fair, there is a need to modernize agriculture to provide livelihood to smaller farmers and they are always the one who's been the hardest, hardest hit by, by difficult situation like this year and last year. What really strikes me in Thailand is that we see a very diverse type of startups, all addressing different nodes of the food and agri supply chain. And in case you don't believe me, I'm joined today by Ponglada Panyangwet, co-founder and CEO of Freshcat. She goes by Bell. Freshcat is a food supply chain platform. They help buy and sell restaurant food supplies connect suppliers and restaurants. They're on a mission to bring restaurants and suppliers into the digital age and help streamline the process. Bell started in marketing and then she specialized in consumer research, market analysis. And after three years in corporate, she started her own business as a food supply service, leveraging on her family business. That's how she started thinking of a solution like FreshKit. And rather than thinking, she made it happen. Welcome, Bell. We are all also joined by Smith Tawi Lerdniti, the founder and CEO of the Plant Meat. Let's Plant Meat is a plant-based meat startup from Thailand, willing to solve air pollution problems through offering a more environmentally conscious meat alternative from Asia to the world. Smith is also the managing director of Niti Foods, which he has grown tremendously over his eight year tenures. I think it's 300 person growth, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and we, will go, we are going to focus on Let's Plant Meat, which is an amazing food technology startup. You really need to know more about them. Last year at the Future Food Asia conference, Let's Plant Meat was awarded the prize for innovation in plant proteins for Asia Pacific by Buller and Givaudan. And last but not least, we are joined by Okrit, Unahar Le Kaka, co-founder and CEO of Recult, and Ukrit goes by Earn. Recult 
leverages machine learning and satellite imagery to help farmers in Thailand and in Pakistan increase farm productivity and access affordable loan. RECUV has won numerous prestigious awards, just to mention a few, best social enterprise in Southeast Asia and Oceania in the global social venture competition, FinTech Disrupt Challenge organized by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Innovative Agribusiness by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And from his work at Recurve, Okrit has been named as Obama leader by the Obama Foundation. Equally amazing is the fact that outside of his work at Recurve, Ern finds time to regularly lecture at Chulalongkorn University. One of my first questions would be, how do you find time for it? And my second question would be, let's go straight into the topic and let's start with the beginning of the food journey that is ours. So Aaron, you, you're very close to the problem of global hunger because you're walking in countries where it is a topic. Mm -hmm. Recut is all about AI, tools, analytics to help gain efficiency in agriculture. You do contribute to solve global hunger, but how do you contribute to solve and improve the livelihood of the farmers you're working with next door, not just the global problem. They are the ones using the solution. So tell us more about Recode. So thanks, Isabel, for the opportunity to share about Recode. So, 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 so basically, we focus on the beginning of the food supply chain, which is at the start, which is from the small scale farmers who produce rice, sugarcane, corn, and so on and so forth, right? So these small scale farmers actually produce majority of the food that we actually consume, especially in the ASEAN region. But unfortunately, they are one of the, among the poorest of, 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 of them all, right? So, so, so basically, um, let, let me give a case in point in Thailand. 40% of the Thai population, or roughly around 20 million people are farmers, but their average income is only two, um, $200 a month. And that is a household income that they have to feed their whole family of five, send their kid to school, that covers medical bills. That, that is the main reason that caused a huge inequality in a country like Thailand, right? And this is not just a local Thai problem, but a global problem affecting farmers in Pakistan, in Indonesia, and Vietnam, in Laos. So if you look at the developing countries, majority of the workforce are actually in agricultural sectors. So they are very important, but they are often overlooked by the government and overlooked by the innovation technology sector. And that is where we come in. So basically in the past couple of years, the access to smartphone, the access to internet has increased rapidly in rural areas. So in Thailand alone, I think around 60 or 70% of the small scale farmers have access to smartphone now. So that means that we can put in key information into the hands of the farmers to help them increase the productivity through data-driven recommendations. So at the backbone of our product is an AI that analyze weather data, supply data, and various soil data, right? And we come up with a very specific customized recommendation for the farmers to plan. Like if you want to grow rice, when should you plant your seed into the soil to get enough rainfall? Um, when it grows, what type of fertilizer you should use and where you should buy it to, to save your cost and where you, you should actually sell it at the end of the season to, to maximize your profitability. So that's where our concept come in, is to use data-driven recommendation and a platform, the digital platform to help connect farmers with different stakeholders in the ecosystem. So, so we just started for around almost three years in Thailand, and we have already reached around 300,000 farmers in Thailand alone, and we are increasing rapidly. So, so, so we have seen that um, regardless what most people say, but farmers, they are like us, they are human beings, so they want to increase their income. They want to have a better livelihood for their, themselves and their family. So they're looking for tools for solutions to increase their income and profitability. So it depends on us as an innovator. How do we digest complex data into something simple that small scale farmers can understand? So, so, so I would start at this first for now. Thank you. Very good, very good. Digesting complex data, that's really a beautiful promise. So 300,000 farmers in Thailand that can benefit from your solution. We wish them a better livelihood. And with this, it offers me a transition to let's plant meat. So we know that when households get wealthier, their diets tilt towards more protein content. Mm -hmm. And to a large extent, more animal protein. Is it by lack of alternative? Is it because it's 
you know, how they've been raised and brought. Tell us more, Smith, about, you know, whether planet Earth has reached its limits and whether you're providing an alternative to these problems, to the much needed, um, much needed solution to the, the shortage of livestock protein for the many, and also to the underlying problem of food system sustainability, not just supply, but also the toll it takes on the environment. Sure. Also, uh, did you know that 83% of the global farmland is to produce, to feed livestock, not for animal, and not, not, not for human. And to get one kilogram of like beef, you have to pour in the 30,000 liter of water. You just multiply this by the factor of 150% because population will grow from 7 billion to 9 billion in the next 30 years. Then we need to have a second planet to start growing something right now. This is something where uh, we, have, we need a lot of uh, resources to grow our beloved meat, egg, and, 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 and milk. And this is something where consumer doesn't see it connection with so much hidden. In Thailand, especially in my home in Chiang Mai, we have suffered for like the pollution problem on the PM2.5 for the past eight years. Right? I mean, looking in the field around us, we see like the field growing uh, and many times growing corn. And the corn is not to feed people, to feed animals. And then once the farmer grow corn, they had to get rid of it by just light the match up and then just to burn it out to, get, to, to start growing the new, the, new, uh, the new crops. And this is something where every household in Chiang Mai have to buy their own air purifier. And we don't see the, how, it could, how it could end because we're still also supporting the demand for the animal feed by eating so much of the meat, egg, and dairy. So we wish from this starting point, we is, is grow into our mission to create a plant-based proteins where if we don't have to get the meat from animal, is if the plant could be more uh, efficient in conversion of the protein toward the diets, how can we make it in this in the way that can sway the decision of the consumers using taste, convenience, and the price? Make sure that uh, in, eventually we'll get sustainability and also our clean air back again. Very interesting. So of course, the day you need to start to arbitrate between having a good quality of air and eating your preferred meat, then we need to, we need to move on to the next stage and, and take action because that's not yeah. a sustainable position. Right. We've spoken about producing more and increasing and improving farmers' livelihood. We've spoken about producing better with Smith. But Bell, I'm turning to you. Statistics on food waste defy imagination. In theory, we produce enough to food, to feed, sorry, 11 billion people, depending on the estimates. Some people say yeah, 11 billion people easily, but it doesn't happen. And we know all, all of you know, the pitfalls of the food supply chain. You have seen from your eyes how supply chains can be inefficient, mm -hmm. how bringing products from farm to market to consumer is daunting. And with fresh cat, in a way, you say, kind of, it doesn't need to be like this. What is your answer to the world's uh, biggest problem, the hunger problem? Yeah. Um, in Thailand, uh, farmers, they are very good at growing produce, but they didn't know how to sell. So fresh cat of a platform allow them to sell directly to the restaurant. The process is that um, once we receive the produce from the farmers, uh, fresh cat partners with processing center to cut and trim and send it to the warehouse where it's packed for the next day delivery uh, to the restaurant. We create our own order management system for the restaurant that works together with our warehouse management system and logistic management system to streamline the whole process. Still currently, we are developing the way to forecast our customers' demands with an accurate forecast. We can share this data with the farms we partner with and they can grow the specific amounts with no surplus. This is what we try to do currently. It's not only the platform, but it is about the data as well. Very interesting, Belle. No, let me, let me ask you a question. You're all driven by a passion, by the feeling that you can really provide solutions to one of the most pressing problems of the food supply chain. You have this long-term vision, which is your compass, which is driving you. Then 
in the day to day, you're probably caught up with dozens of things, not to say thousands of things. So I would like to focus my next question on, you know, what helps you arbitrate between the nice to have and the essential? And I'll turn to Earn. How do you measure your impact? You're an impact company by every definition. But would you say impact is always correlated to your revenues? Or do you sometimes find yourself arbitrating between grabbing some low hanging fruit with some customers, some clients, and taking more impactful decisions, but which are maybe more difficult to implement? OK, thank you. I think this is a question really close to my heart is the impact side of my business. So, so as I mentioned earlier, how we use data to help the farmers. And on the other hand, we can also use the data we model to help banks extend affordable loans to them or help them access low, cheaper input fertilizer seed and so on. Right. So, 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 so by having these networks effect of uh, ecosystem that we built for farmers, the most obvious impact that we try to measure for them is the profitability increase for the farmers. When I say profitability, doesn't mean only revenue increase, but the, the decrease in cost as well, but the net profit margin that we can create from connecting farmers to various services. So, so that is the obvious first thing that we measure as a company. And then we try to benchmark ourselves against the UN SDG goals. So there are around 17 goals, right? That covers inequality, environment, social, and so on and so forth. So I think we cover around five to six um, of them, such as first is increasing the income, reducing poverty. Second is more environmental. We make sure that farmers practice sustainable farming. Third is the climate impact. How, how to help farmers cope with the climate change and various things that, that come up. But I think you raise an important point is that how do we balance our revenue versus our impact? Because obviously we are not a nonprofit. We cannot just do good and just be happy, right? So we have to be have a sustainable business model as well. And as a company, we also raise funding from traditional VCs because unfortunately, there are not enough impact VC in, in the Southeast Asian region. So that means that by having both traditional VC and impact investors from Europe on our board, we will, we have to balance both. I, I mean, in my ideal world, I would have would love to forget about my revenue and just focus on helping the farmers. But by having traditional VC as our investor, we also have revenue target to meet. So that means that realistically, we sometimes still have to hit the low hanging fruit that we still need to generate revenue compared to just focusing on impact, impact, impact. So, so I mean, there is more impact that I, I wish I could make if I don't have to care about revenue side. But realistically, since we have traditional VC on our board, we have to hit the revenue side as well. I really like the way you talk about traditional VC. Um, I would maybe propose to rephrase it slightly differently, but with a very same intention behind. Um, ventures like yours, they really need patient money, patient mm -hmm. capital. And it's not exactly the quality of venture investors to be very patient. So that's something we are going to talk about, which really nicely brings me to, to Smith again. You're on to a slightly different challenge. You're here to, to some extent, to change consumer behaviors. And we all know how sticky behaviors are, especially when it comes to the food we love. So do you feel the need to educate Thai consumers would you think Thai consumers are different from the others? And how do they react to this protein challenge? Are they aware of it? And how do you do? Sure. So I think you, you, you just hit it nail. I mean, education of the market is the key part of work that we have here. So we have to tell why, why I have to switch, why we have to eat the plant-based meat, right? Think about like when any innovation, there's an early adopter and then the mainstream market. Don't talk about the late adopter. I mean, the, luckily when we have this, uh, early adopter like the vegan and vegetarian people, uh, they congregate around like the social network group, like the in Facebook group around the country. So we start having a conversation, just share idea or listen to their idea. They have probably have some reviews of our product or some other competitive products. And we get some feedback on what is good and what is bad about the product. So we think about how can we meet their expectation. Uh, recently, I think, uh, I love, like, like last night I was joined a clubhouse. So start a vegan group, start talking about and then review themselves about like all the plant-based meat around the country, which is something where we like to participate to hear the, the voice of consumers. And, but we could not persuade the consumer by the fact of the sustainability message alone. 
it's still too far away from Thai consumer or even everybody, mm-hmm. right? But to, to, to reach the mainstream market, we have to talk about the benefit that close to their, to their heart, which is their life. Talk about like health benefits, right? This is something where, how, how can we position the health message on eating plant-based meat versus eating animal-based proteins will reduce or improve your problem on like cholesterol, diabetes, strokes, heart, and can- heart disease and cancer. And this is something where it's probably the taboo from like the FDA point of view and also on the medical standpoint. So we have to be like very nimble and delicate on how can we find the right message and talk about it. And we start try to try to uh, persuade them more like taste and also you get the better health. And then eventually you get the better world for yourself and for your next generation. And this is something where we would love to have it. And yes, the consumer is not always very rational. They love what they have on their plate and it's difficult to bend their, their, their mindset, but you're doing a great job helping them understand that it's also good for them by the same token. Let me turn mm-hmm. to Bell. When we hear marketplaces, supply chain platforms, we understand the gist of it. We understand that it will make it more convenient for the end users. It will be streamlined, more efficient. But more fundamentally, and I refer to what Jean Hua said before, when we had this panel discussion with Paul, he said that they have been very intentional in developing privileged relationship with local partners. They could have gone to the highest bidder. They haven't always. Of course, they're running a business like you guys. I understand that FreshCat does not carry inventory. So what kind of relationships do you build with your farmers? Yes, because we are the B2B platform. We connect um, supplier, farmer with the restaurant. But to be honest, there is a mismatch between um, restaurant and the farmer, for sure, uh, especially their um, consistency, quality, something like that. That's the reason why we have fresh get right in between so for the farmers uh, we work daily with a uh, farm uh, head of the farmers uh, from cities around bangkok to ensure that we get the amount of produce we need and sometimes you know it's a kind of um, i would say professional courtesy sometimes when they have um, surplus we will offer to buy part of it right to maintain a good relationship sometimes good or bad right we are a partner i think it's not about the technology but it is mm-hmm. about your courtesy professional courtesy that is the reason what uh, we this is this is the how we treat our uh, farmers in our community and maybe you can share a few anecdotes as to how this has happened last year i suppose 2020 has been a very particular year yes for example uh, the stream Last year, the farmer has difficulty um, on the surplus of of Mm. gym. So for the restaurant as well, right, for COVID last year, so we opened the platform for the consumer. Uh, And then we uh, offer the farmers to buy the stream and then uh, sell to the consumer instead of the restaurant. And uh, we can sell about one ton a day to help the restaurant. I'm sorry, to help the farmers. That's quite significant. Thank you so much for your insights, your energy, your passion are contagious. Entrepreneurs like you, you have a multiplier effect. I don't know if you realize this, you will be encouraging another generation of entrepreneurs, they will learn from you. And this is really what Future Food Asia is about. We want to catalyze this energy. Not everything will work, but we know that we need to have a collective effort to change the the system we are in. So there are many platforming people, sorry, in this virtual room. There are also many people in our virtual community, in our extended community. And since we are here today together, I would like to ask you to make a wish. I don't pretend we will find a solution to your wish, but if there were one thing you would like to, to get, to get access to, to be knowledgeable about, to propel your startup to new height, what would it be? Who wants to start first? We can start. Great, <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so I think my wish would be like an add-on to to what I was saying earlier about about my um, investment um, experience. So, so I would wish that um, we see that invest in food and agriculture industry are more patient with with, with their startups because, as you know, that food, right? Let, let's say you grow rice, you grow um, mangoes, or grow any crops, it takes 
half a year to at least half a year to a year for for for, for the fruits or the rice that comes out, right? So it is not like a dating app where you can just make an app and you can find your soulmate right away within a night to prove your product. But an app that helps the farmers is actually takes at least a season long or two season long, which take a couple of years to prove our model out, right? So that's the first part about helping the farmers. So so the, so I hope that the investor will be patient and understand that this sector it is very important, but it may take time to prove ourselves. And another thing is related to being patient is for like large agribusiness that, that, that transact with the farmers, such as restaurants or banks or large agricultural mills. In, in Southeast Asian region, we see a lot of large agricultural mills, such as cassava mills or sugarcane mills or palm oil mills, right? And these businesses are usually extremely huge, but they are quite, um, have been operating for many years. I, I would hope that this business would open up themselves and be willing to try new digital products to help streamline and digitize the supply chain, right? So be, having an open mind and being, being willing to try new things would definitely help increase adoption of digital, digital tools to digitize this whole ecosystem. I, I completely empathize with what you said. And I would say when investors have been used to see explosive growth, like you can see in social media, e-commerce, it's difficult to tell them you have to wait two seasons to see whether the solution works on this crop. It's, it's unnatural for them to be patient. But I see hope, and I don't see hope very far away from where we are. I see hope with the little hindsight we have the, with five years mm. of tenure at Future Food Asia, where honestly, five years ago, people were not so interested. People large family having agribusinesses in the region, they were a little distant, exactly like what you have described, and they are coming into full force. They really start to wake up to the opportunity, not just to the problem, but to the fact that it's the future of their, their children they are preparing, simply said. And the new generations are sometimes very unforgiving, and it's a good thing because it really pushes the, uh, the other generations to, to, to take action. Mm -hmm. What is your wish, Bell? if you have one, maybe many. <laughs> if I choose one, okay, um, it's quite an opposite way because for first get, we have to grow demand so fast, right? To upstream and buy directly to the farmers, right? The more demand we have, the more uh, volume and product category that we can upstream to the farmers. So if I can wish, I wish to have a machine that I can create and copy the talent Yes. Copying the talents. <laughs> Tell us more. How do you see this? Maybe it will be your next venture. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of, kind of, uh, because, you know, um, we have uh, strategies, right? But uh, people implement their strategy. So uh, have a talents who can implement uh, the strategy, can drive the business, go super, super fast. I believe that and I believe in team. So that's what I want. Does it mean that you spend a huge amount of your time recruiting and training people? Yes, it should be at this stage. Uh, we will focus yeah. on hiring process, or yeah. onboarding and training people. I think it's a short, term, it's a long term investment, but it's worth it. Okay, great. Smith, what is your dream and wish? <laughs> sure. So uh, price of the plant based meat is still uh, a hurdle. Right, when you're uh -huh. comparing to the beef, I think it, the price could be equivalent, but we talk about like pork products. Plant-based meat is still like three to four times more expensive. And the reason, the, the fact that uh, the price is, uh, the price of animal meat is so cheap because it have like direct and indirect subsidies from the government or the price control from the government so that retailers charge almost nothing to selling the animal proteins, right? And plant-based meat didn't have something to enjoy like that. Right, because the government tried to support and assist millions of farmers into the animal production at the expense of climate change and the sicker population. When we have the better option, so if we could have enjoyed the same like price control or the, the retailer could, could, uh, could take less margin so that the population can start switching to have plant-based meat without having to like spend so much of the, their uh, like we call it uh, limited income, right? So I think it's, it's, it's the way to move the population to the right, uh, the right motive, the right uh, better health, and then the more uh, 
more sustainability uh, uh, society that we have right now. So I hope that this is not just about the less time meat alone, but for the whole industry together. So for the industry, when we came into here, we believe that whoever wins is the win for the humanities, right? So we want to win together and win together is because we don't have enough time to reverse our climate change. And this is something where government and retailers association could help and making sure that the people can start adopting it uh, very rapidly. And you're touching on a very interesting topic, the sometimes the dilemma between maintaining livelihood of farmers, the ones farming livestock, and also going to where the future takes us. It's a very interesting way to pinpoint it because solutions are never black and white. And we know it's a mm -hmm. process and we need all the talents on board to, to get to where we need to be in a few years time. We are starting to talk again and again about you know, regenerating the natural systems, not just conserving them, not just having a neutral carbon footprint, but mm -hmm. building the ecosystem that can fix and, and save the planet. That's where we are today. That's really great to have you today. You are perfect examples of the diversity of startups in Thailand, and we hope you will encourage many entrepreneurs behind you. I would like to thank our friends from Gobi Partners for supporting this initiative in conjunction to Future Food Asia. Thank you, Smith. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Thank you, Belle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. We know that webinars are just so many these days, but we would like to give a, a chance to many people who have expressed interest for our topics to ask their questions. So we are moving to the Q&A session now. Hi. Here we are again. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you all again. So let's go straight to the point. Um, Ern, you talked about traditional VC investors, you talked about impact investors, and apparently there is more than a nuance between the two categories. So from the questions we have received, I think it can, it's quite obvious that we have a number of entrepreneurs and maybe aspiring entrepreneurs in the room who would like to know what the fundraising process is like in this industry. And maybe before you start to address this question, you could remind us of which stage of funding your company is at. The question is really for the three of you. So feel free. Okay. Who wants to start? Maybe I can start first. Okay, so, so for recount, um, thanks a lot for this great question. So, so we are in around pre-series A stage, we raised around 5 million US dollars. So I think a sizable pre-series A. So we raised around 4 million US dollar from traditional like venture capitalists from both in Thailand and in Singapore. And then we also raised around almost a million US dollar from impact investor from Europe and from the US. So I think we are unique in the sense that we, we have a good mix between impact investor and uh, uh, financial investor as well. So, so the process took us pretty long. It took us around four to six months at least to close around from starting to talk with the investor to, to closing a deal. If some investor took us almost a year even. So, so, so I feel that compared to when I was in the US, maybe the investor here are still slower to make a decision compared to the US investors. But overall, it has been a pleasant experience, but we just have to uh, have, uh, I mean, sorry, I, I mean, we, we may have to spare enough time and have enough runway to manage this process. Very interesting. Uh, what about you, Pong Lada? Okay, for, for first get, we just raised the uh, Series A from um, Financial VC uh, from Singapore. Uh, for Series A, we want to scale the business. So we targeting uh, Financial VC who can help us grow faster and can help connect us to uh, the VC next round. Uh, raising fund with um, regional financial VC has no easy task. We need to do due diligence in terms of business, team, ESG, legal, and finance. It's, it's like a checklist. Um, it took around six to eight months for due diligence process. Um, as Ern said, uh, you have to make sure that during the process, you have enough runway. What about you, Smith? So my situation is a little bit unique. So we have uh, funding from the kind of the mother company that Needy Food is we doing. So we explore the 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 startup uh, route, and then we found that it's a lot of uncertainty in the plant based adoption. 
in Asia right now where we don't see, I mean, like the, the growth to be to be like as fast as what we wish. So if we so we were to, to focus on like spending on the fundamental, right? How to get and get the product out, how can we make sure that we partner with the cust with the right customer in other country? And we we found that I mean through the process we can actually uh, make it a little bit positive cash flow easily from from this top point of view. So we like to harvest uh, the reap the, the the fruits of the research that we have so far and try to market it so that we have some certain uh, certain adoption going on and let's wait and see how how we can grow from there again. So we're a little bit lucky on on that we have the business to a little bit funding on that. Which offers me a good transition to another question. Um, um, a delegate would like to know which are the hurdles for Thai plant-based meat to go to global sales? Sure. So I think uh, global sales have to maybe think about like the, the Western world where vegan and then the, the established player are there, like the beyond impossible or in Europeans. So they have a high expectation on like the food uh, food safety condition. You have to be like BRC certified, you have to be IVA certified. And then you have to, to get like maybe like the, the non-GMO certified or even vegan certified where in Asia, we don't have that certification body to, 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 uh, to certify. So I think it's still, uh, it's still a little bit early, but we feel that, uh, but people feel that uh, plant-based meat with Thai or Southeast Asian, I mean, specifically on the, Asian recipe or cuisine could be something that unique where the world want to make uh, what 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 it tasted from from the country like Thailand. And when you think about when you had the meat and then okay, what what about the sauce? The sauce is of the weekend. So how can we bring the sauce and all the condiments together to create the convenience? Or uh, end of the day, we are selling convenience to consumer where they just prefer the vegan or plant-based or sustainable. Interesting. I have a question for Rickard. So people are curious, they would like to know which mobile feature on your app has been the most successful in terms of uptake, in terms of active farmers usage. And how do you explain this? Um, an adjacent question is if farmers cannot pay for your services, who is paying for it? Okay, so so I mean, for Rickard, our target customer uh, uh, farmers at the bottom of the pyramid, small scale farmers in Thailand, which is quite similar to farmers in Indonesia, Malaysia as well. They are usually in their around 50 to 60s, have only up to sixth grade, uh, 12th grade of education. So that means that what we see is that even though we have many features in our app, but the most used feature are still weighted data because these farmers, since they are quite old now and they don't have much education, so they want to use a feature that they can easily relate to and with a forecast, accurate weather forecast and helping them plan when they should plant their seed, put fertilizer or even harvest based on the rainfall patterns or drought period is most relatable to them. Even though we have other features such as satellite technology or the drone services, right? But we realize that those uptakes are usually come from younger fa farmers, which has less, which, which is less of our user pools. So, 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 so I mean, I mean that, 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 that's fine because we want to let as many farmers use as possible, even though the weather is the most um, obvious one the farmer use, but we are still coming up with new and more and more features that, that is beneficial to other type more innovative farmer as well. In terms of our business model, even though we make the app free for the farmers, uh, we connect them to like input companies or banks to provide loans or even insurance company to sell like life insurance or crop insurance to these farmers. And we actually make margin from each transaction. So think of us like, you know, Shopee or Alibaba where you can access the platform for free to see different products and use different service, but the platform makes the commission out of the transaction. Got it. Moving back to a question, which is a bit of a replica of a question Paul asked Jean Roy earlier today. And since you're the entrepreneurs, you might have a very different stance on this. So the question is, are the current public policies sufficient to support the development of agri food tech innovation? What support do you think the government should provide or consider improving to ease the business and drive better progress in Thailand? And the question is for the three of you. 
Pibel, uh, you want to start first? Or? <laughs> yeah, for me, um, for our business specific, we we have found out that reaching out to food grower or farmer is a um, challenging task because there is a mismatch between the buyer and 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 the farmers. I think um, government can help to improve the co-op organization for rural farmers to organize the farmer in terms of yield management, knowledge sharing, uh, post harvest process and management, including uh, product consolidation. It would um, help us to reach out to the farmers and work with the farmers easier. Very interesting. What about you, Smith? Do you need any support? Maybe not. I think no. Uh, I think government has done a lot. I mean, if you uh, be in Thailand, you see like a lot of grants, a lot of program support, like from the NIA or NACDA. I think the, the Ministry of uh, Science are uh, providing a lot of uh, assistance on a project basis, right? If you know how to get that, or even the BOI board investment, you can bring in, bring on the, the talents, or if you are doing something good and interesting, or even like the Department of International Trade Promotion, assisting Thai company to help finding the business buyer overseas. I think government of Thailand try to help so much. If you are trying to like be a good uh, manufacturer or brand builder, and you want to create something good in the country. So I think that the thing that could be improved upon is maybe like the rule and regulation where, I mean, to get the permit, I mean, uh, yeah, you can get it, it quickly, but then the supporting, like the supporting certain policy still doesn't have like the, the method or no provider, you have to get tested this year to get this certified, but no, no certified body in such a way. So we can see a little bit roadblock a little bit and there, we hope that you to get this clear uh, later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. What about you, Aaron? Yes, yeah, so 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 I agree with what Kun Smith said earlier that government already provides certain support, but I think there are more that that the government can support, right? Especially for deep tech um, startup that works in agricultural sectors that requires multiple years to prove out their product. Like I, I mean, like if you have like a good to sell that you take need one to two years to develop and sell your product, I think what government is doing is enough like plant based, based meat for example which i think government is doing well but if you need like a if you create a deep tech that requires three to five years to do r d six or seven years to commercialize right the time horizon is too long i, I think that the, the support from the government is not enough at the moment so, so, so there are two ways that the government can support first they should provide more patient capital grants so right now the Thai government gives up grants to around a million baht, which is around 30 US dollars. But I mean, if you do a hardcore research, mm -hmm. you know you need more money, right? And something that doesn't tie to a quick win KPI that, that the government usually require company in Thailand to write up a report, like tons of documentation <laughs> that we have to write up, which, which I think um, the government can help ease this process and provide more patient capital, maybe like up to 500 US dollars or even a million US dollars, like what the Singaporean or the US government usually provide. Second is letting the government actually be the customers of the technology that Thai startup actually develop, right? In, because government, they have the most money to spend and they can take more risk. So I think they should be the early movers that are willing to try and support the Thai startups by actually being a customer of Thai company rather than waiting for a successful company from the US or Israel or Austria to come in and just capture the market. Very interesting insights. I have to say, given the acceleration we have seen since we've been running Future Food Asia for the past four years, I'm quite hopeful things will also accelerate in the good direction in terms of public support. And I hope your message has been well heard by the relevant people. Before, thank you very much for being here today. Before mm -hmm. handing over to JJ, I would like to thank you for your insights again. And um, I would like to thank Gobi Partners for being our partners for this event. It, Gobi is a very established fund and entity. Um, and the fact that you're turning to food tech means a lot to us. And the fact that you're supporting Future Food Asia also means a lot to me. So thank you very much. JJ, over to you. All right. Thank you so much for those kind words, Isabel. Um, and thank you to our panelists and to everyone for joining us today. Um, we've had a huge audience, actually, and that just goes to show the huge interest in agri-food tech and in, in Thailand as well. Um, and we hope you've enjoyed the sessions. Uh, just a reminder that Future Food Asia is open for applications. The prize is 100,000 US dollars. Um, so let me just send the link again to the chat right now. Do check it out. 
And yep, as for Gobi Partners, we'll be hosting more events like these. So let us know what you'd like to see from and hear from us. And okay, I'm signing off for today. Thank you all. And I hope you have a great day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.